Good morning folks, it's Riley here from the Austin Players Off-Road Motorcycle Club and today is the big day, the classique, the big ride, 400 plus motorcycles, 40 something plus teams of 10 and we've got a team once again this year so here I am in the parking lot waiting for Jason to show up. So six o'clock, Jason is a little late. Now when you're a member of the Awesome Players, you get some very nice service. So here you see the ramp is down, the wheel chalk is ready, and waiting for Jason is a Tim Ho! And here comes the man himself! A legend in his own mind! Riding the mighty KTM 500. Can he make it into the trailer? Morning! Hello, sir. Looks like a mighty fine day to break bikes. Yep. Morning, and LA. The fan base. Hey, have a good day. After a little less than an hour's drive while we sipped on our Timmy Ho coffees, we arrived at the fairgrounds in La Chute, and this would be the starting point for the 2018 edition of La Classique. So as you can see, it's quite a mix of bikes and people. There was uh, something like 40 teams. Each team has 10 members, and I think this year there was five different routes in terms of level of difficulty. We would be doing the route called La Grosse Inconsciente, which basically is the route for big bikes with uh, the highest level of difficulty. In English, it would be called the Big Bertha route. We have been going to this event for many years, and it is amazingly well put together. There is a hardcore bunch of volunteers who put this... Uh, event on and now there's people coming from all over there was people from New Brunswick coming in from Ontario from down in the United States and to cater to the uh, the non-natives there's even a briefing in English so if you'd like to come to this event in the future uh, don't be shy and come on down I will put the link in the uh, description below so after the briefing which is a pretty standard briefing about the being nice and being safe we waited for our turn to take off. One of the great things about the Classique is it always happens early in the season. In this case, we are in early May. So it is that one event that forces you to get your bike ready, sort out all your equipment, and actually start the season. So it is a great kickoff event. On our team, we had uh, a bunch of different bikes. We had DR650, we had a Honda CRF250L, we had the 701, we had a 690, we had uh, Dave on the F800, Mark on the big Africa Twin. So we had a pretty eclectic mix of bikes. And I was the, uh, the team leader, team leader in name only, since uh, pretty much everybody on this team is capable of leading. And Probably for most of the day, I would actually be somewhere towards the rear of the pack because uh, uh, that's where I like hey, to be. Senna. Hello, Senna. Mesh. Here you can hear me trying to get this intercom system working. And if you spent any time at all hanging around with the awesome players, you know how much we enjoy our Senna <laughs> communication systems. Anyways, it was our turn to leave, so we headed out through the uh, Climb Klim Arch, however you pronounce it. And a lot of teams just speed off at top speed. They actually give you quite a bit of junk in terms of your t-shirt and all kinds of swag. So instead of carrying it all day, we usually head right back to the trucks and dump this stuff off. As you can see, it was looking like a pretty nice day. And it is always nice to start out dry, but the forecast for the day 
was that at some point we would be getting wet. The awesome players have done quite a few of these events over the years and we take a rather lackadaisical approach to them a somewhat low-key approach you might say uh, there's some teams that have a, a do or die attitude we tend to be a little more mellow and on previous events we were paired up in groups with some real hard chargers and that just didn't work out and we ended up breaking the group in half and kind of going our separate way but on this day we knew everyone in our group and uh, we were all of the same mindset that we were just going to go out ride as much as we possibly could while still having fun and when we'd had our fill we would head back to the restaurant and have a nice meal and a few beers and then go home. After a little stint on the tarmac we ended up in the dirt and here we are skirting along the side of the highway and uh, that's when something odd happened. This doesn't happen very often. We started encountering bikes coming the other way Normally this is because either they're lost or we are lost, but I think on this particular case there was some mix-up with the routes, so it was a little sketchy. And at one point, another big bike coming the other way got a little squirrely, and uh, I had a little moment of panic there where I thought he was going to trade some paint with me, but in the end it all worked out. On these routes there will be sections of off-road connected by either gravel roads and sometimes paved roads and that's kind of the format for the whole day which is one of the reasons you need a street legal bike because you will be uh, driving on public roads. We popped out of this section of woods, got onto some gravel and it was quite dry so there was a little bit of dust and then we were back into the woods and after another short little hop, we came to our first real obstacle of the day. One of the signs you've come up to a decent obstacle will be the parking lot of bikes blocking the trail. And this usually means that there's an obstacle that's requiring a little bit of manpower to get through or where people are getting stuck and need to be muscled through. And this was no exception. There was a sizable mud hole and no easy bypass so people were uh, chewing their way through it and a lot of them were needing a helping hand so this is a this is a moment when it's nice to jump off the bike grab the other camera and get some action shots once i got up to the mud hole i could see that the group ahead of us still had a few bikes to get through here they are using their version of the douche rope which you can obviously see is the wrong color and then it's always nice to just spectate and sit there and watch one by one as everybody tries to figure out what the best way through is. And in this case, right through the middle seemed to be a popular choice, although it didn't work out too well for this gentleman. Sometimes just moving over a foot or two can make a huge difference. And also, having a can-do attitude can sometimes make a huge difference. This was a case where uh, giving it a little juice would certainly help. And there goes Ivan on the 690 with the rally kit. Of course, you don't want to do that if you don't know what's living down in that hole. Next up was Chris on the HP2. Little different sound than those little single cylinders. And uh, Mark was going to go a little bit farther to the left where we'd seen some of the other guys try it, so we warned him off. Dave came by on the right hand track and uh, spun it, put a quick tug on the crash bars and the 800 was out then it was Mark's turn to wade in on the big Africa twin sounds nice oh no he had forgotten his traction control and then he was through that is a nice sounding bike 
the little Honda 250. This was actually a friend of Mark's, and Mark had lent him his uh, spare bike. JP on the WR250. And then it was time to hand off the camera to someone else and see if I could get the Husky through here without embarrassing myself. A little hesitant, but then once the front wheel dropped in, got on the gas, and the Husky made easy work of it. One of the things to keep in mind with the Classic being so early in the season is that for a lot of people, it is actually the first ride of the season. So quite often you set off on this ride and you are rusty. Not only are your riding skills rusty, but your GPS navigation skills can be a little rusty as well. Now the Classic is a full day's ride, that is for sure. So instead of just uh, rolling uh, hours and hours of footage here, I'll, uh, I'll show you a little montage of what uh, the terrain is like near Montreal where we ride. And as you can see it's pretty varied from some nice uh, groomed gravel roads to some more kind of backcountry roads. And then the stuff we really enjoy, which uh, we would call trails, a lot of people might call it an ATV trail. Every time you see the shot of the front wheel, that is courtesy of Mark on the Africa Twin, who had his GoPro bolted down low. And that really gives you a view of the trails where you can see that it wasn't that mucky. And even though this is spring, uh, the trails were in pretty good shape. There have been years during the Classic where some sections of trail have still had snow on them, but this year the Classic was happening a little later in the year and the trails were in really good condition. So we were making good time, not too many navigational issues, really enjoying the route when JP had a problem. Now you got the guys who think they should carry a metal stick to hold their bike up, you're much better off carrying a, a saw. saw. And then you can make any stick you want. Oh, yeah. JP, what's happening? JP? He wants video. He wants video. Hey. What's happening, Bill? Got a flat tire. Good. We needed some action. We, we It was way too smooth this morning. Thanks. We knew you did it on purpose. One of the things we figured out over the years when you have a breakdown is if the bike can still move, Find a spot where other bikes can easily spot you so they don't come around a corner and find a big surprise. And get yourself comfortable. Take your jacket off, get out your bug net, and then get to work. Use your fingers, get it open. You're halfway in. <laughs> JP's vibrator. His girlfriend's bored today. Yeah, man. Oh, look at the blood on the forehead and everything. Uh, you look, uh, you look really? over. Yeah. Uh, 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 you need a neck. The neck. You can see the bugs flying around here in front of the camera. So the bug net is an essential part of every awesome player's toolkit. As you can see, Jason was very busy over the winter working on his KTM and he had a custom sticker kit made up. Very nice. We are big believers here at the Awesome Players in electric pumps and there are so many small portable versions of these electrical pumps available. There's really no reason to be working up a sweat with a hand pump or goofing around with CO2 cartridges. More air pressure! <laughs> Spoiler alert, JP would be very happy to have an electric pump today. We got JP's wheel sorted out and we're back on the road in pretty short order. And off we went once again. Now since we ride around Montreal on a regular basis, quite a few of the trails that are part of the Classique we're familiar with. Other sections are new to us. Now one of the caveats of the Classique is that you get that GPS route, which has all these great trails. It doesn't mean, sadly, that you can come back the next weekend and ride all of those trails again. The organizers do 
get permission and have uh, special access granted to them for certain trails and roads through private property that are not uh, public for the rest of the year. So you have to be a little careful about just uh, rerunning this route when it's not the classic weekend. Years ago when we first started doing these videos, I would just roll the entire day and if we had two or three guys with GoPros, everybody would roll. And you might have seen in the old videos us doing a hand clap and then we would synchronize the cameras using that hand clap. And the beauty of it rolling for two or three hours or until the batteries died in your GoPro was that you could synchronize those one, two, three or four cameras based on that one hand clap and they would stay in sync for two or three hours. The downside is if you have three, four cameras running for that long, now that three hours has ballooned into nine or twelve hours of footage. The other way to do it is just to let people start and stop their GoPros whenever they want. The problem with that is you end up with all this footage and you have no idea where it happened throughout the day. The nice thing is that since the GoPro 3 Plus came out, the time of day is actually stamped right into each video clip. So what we do now is we let everybody start and stop their cameras as much as they want. As long as the clock is set correctly on their camera, I can bring the footage into my editing system and the editing system will actually position it in the correct spot during the day. So I'll put up a, a shot here of my timeline in my editing system. The blue camera is my camera and the green camera is Mark's camera and the software automatically positioned all of those shots when they actually happened that day and it just makes editing so much easier. The other thing that I really like to use uh, is a feature on the GoPro called loop mode. So instead of starting and stopping um, and trying to guess when something interesting is going to happen, you put your GoPro in loop mode, you start recording, and the GoPro keeps the last five minutes. So you're rolling along, you're recording, you're recording, something interesting happens, you hit stop, and it keeps the last five minutes. And then at the end of the day, you have all these short video clips of all the interesting things that happened instead of 20 hours of footage. The morning was coming to an end and we could actually see that we were getting close to our destination for lunch. And we have done this ride many times, but we have not made it to lunch that many times because usually we get so far behind, we get so stuck or something that we don't make it to lunch and have to jump right to the supper meeting. But on this particular day, despite JP's flat, we were making really good time and uh, the terrain here rolling up to Fort West which is a paintball facility where they host lunch was uh, very familiar to us because we've ridden here quite a bit over the years and we knew that uh, at some point there would be that one big last steep downhill that would lead us into the hydro line and it would be time for a well-deserved break. One of the perks of uh, the lunch break is that quite often you bump into people that you might not have seen since last year's Classic, and this year was no exception and uh, saw quite a few familiar faces. After a decent lunch and some chit chat, it was time once again to head back out on the trail and the first thing would be climbing back up the steep hill that had led us down to lunch at the end of the morning ride. Now this hill, if you look back on one of our older classic videos, has been improved quite a bit because uh, we had ridden up this same hill one year and it was in much sorrier shape so someone had uh, invested quite a bit of time and money in improving this road. The afternoon was going really well. We were rolling along at a good pace and the trails were interesting and everyone was having a good time. Even the Senna intercom system was working pretty well when 
once again, JP was on the side of the road with a flat tire. JP! Hey. What's happening? Uh, another flat tire. <sighs> You're now into beer time, JP. This yeah. Is serious. You know what's the difference between a noosh and a knack? What? <laughs> Tabarnak. knack. <laughs> The second one is the Batman. We have Riley. to have date. What's up with the saw? We are yes, once sir. again well cutting a branch man. for JP's bike. <laughs> Ideally, we like a, a branch with a yeah, Y. Yeah, that's why I hate the lake. <laughs> but we will take this tree. Okay. C'est qui? C'est toi qui voulais l'essayer? Damn. Vas-y, prends le dessert. Damn. Vas-y, on a pour le dernier, right? Ah, wait. That's enough? Maybe that's why I lost my rear end. Oh, the blue is coming. No, 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 no. Oh, it was blue. Precision measurement. Measured. No, no, no. Moi, j'ai pas, j'ai pas acheté la connexion. Je dois. Once. Oh, be nice. I think we should just tie it to the bike. Yeah, you should. Now, JP, you have to carry this piece of wood. Yeah. So that way you'll never ever have a flat again. Now of course if you have a second flat on the same wheel, you should probably spend a little time figuring out why. Chris, supervising? Oh, it's mm -hmm. gonna start to rain. That's okay. Okay, good, lube. Yeah, and it'll keep the dust down. Yeah. Oh, oh. The valve out. La valve so the valve's right here. <laughs> hey, you know what you need? A rim lock. Hey, there's your flat right there. <laughs> Let me see it. I think we can patch this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, no, that's you patchable. Need, you, need, you need valve glue. <laughs> valve glue, okay. Hey, it's a little hot. So we it. just have to glue that on. Yeah. Hang on, I've got tape. We can gorilla tape it. Gorilla tape. I yeah, saw gorilla that. tape. Yeah, valve so we weren't quite sure <laughs> what had caused the flat. It <laughs> certainly <laughs> wasn't the valve ripping out. The valve ripped oh, out shit. because oh, JP had driven on the flat for a little while. But uh, yeah, Ivan, we gave Ivan, the rim a pretty turn. thorough yeah, a search valve. and we couldn't find anything wrong. Hey. <laughs> Any dust back there, Jason? Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's quite clean the air. Is that here. brown Why? cocaine then, or what is that on your face? Don't tell anyone, oh, right? Oh, heroin is brown, sorry. I just like a little bit of uh, <laughs> brown sugar in my cocaine. No, I know, but not with the 21 Brown <laughs> sugar. <laughs> it's amazing how helpful people can be when they realize that the faster we get this flat fixed, the faster we get to the finish, and the sooner we get that ice cold beer. We got the wheel back on the mighty WR, and uh, at this point, JP couldn't quite figure out what was going on with his rear wheel, but he decided to just head by road right to the finish line and the rest of us would head off and continue the track for the rest of the afternoon. Now sadly, JP's life would continue to be eventful and shortly after he left us, he had another flat and at this point he said screw it. He ended up just riding on a flat rear tire for 30 or 40 or 50 kilometers. I can't remember how far it was. Uh, and uh, ended up at the finish line. Meanwhile, the rest of us continued following the magic lines on our GPSs, and Mother Nature opened up a bit, and now we actually had some real rain, and it was getting a little bit chillier. A little further along, we ended up at one of our regular haunts, which is this bridge that crosses this little river, and beside the bridge is a river crossing, which we call the unnecessary or gratuitous river crossing. And a few of the boys decided, what the hell, let's go play in the water. I decided to get fancy and put the GoPro right in the water to get a nice action shot of Mark on the Africa Twin crossing. The first crossing went so well, Mark decided to do it coming the other way. Sadly, at this point, the lens was a bit wet, and as sometimes happens, you hit some weird little rock, and it's slippery, and things go sideways, and the next thing you know, you're paddling, and your boots are full of water.
for some strange reason, Mark's bike now did not want to start. So we were uh, checking the usual culprits, the side stand safety switch, the clutch cutout. But yeah, something had either gotten wet, although the water wasn't very deep and he hadn't really splashed anything. Something was up. Well, Mark was giving the Honda starter motor a workout. Pat on the mighty DR showed him how it was done. After wiggling a few things and playing with a few wires, Mark hit the magic button and the big Honda roared back to life, much to everyone's relief because we were starting to get a little thirsty. Just before leaving, Ivan decided to give it a, a try, so I got the camera back down in the water for the dramatic angle, and Ivan also hit that mysterious object down there and ended up stalling out. At this point, I think we all agreed that we'd spent enough time playing around in this puddle, and it was time to get out of here. Quite a bit of the next leg of the ride was on trails that we are familiar with, but the rain continued and things started to get greasy, and this is where you'll see the difference between the smaller bikes and the big bikes. When it gets a little messy, a lot of the times on the smaller bikes you can save it, but on the big bikes, once they start going sideways, down they go. Now we always recommend that on these big bikes, wait for someone to come and help you pick it up. One of the reasons you might have just had that spill in the afternoon is that you're a little more tired than you were in the morning when you were all fresh. So the last thing you need now is to get into a vicious circle where you fall down, you pick up that 500 pound bike which sucks even more energy out of you, and then you reach another tough section and you fall down again and you pick up the bike. So uh, there's no shame in asking for help. And this is also a good way of evening the playing field so that the guys who are on the cheater bikes on the small bikes end up feeling just as whipped at the end of the day. For those of you who are not from North America, and certainly from our neck of the woods, you may not realize what a huge impact beavers have on our environment here. And here you can see us going by this beaver dam. The beavers really can change the terrain. They will build a dam which can flood a huge area and turn something into a lake. Sometimes they'll flood an entire area that'll turn into a swamp and then over many, many years that swamp will eventually silt up and become solid earth. So the beavers can have this incredible impact on their surroundings. In keeping with our beaver theme, here's a little piece of trivia for you folks who are not Canadian. The beaver, the most industrious of all the rat family, is actually the national animal of Canada. We were on the home stretch now and we had this highway run back to La Chute where we would be meeting the rest of the participants at Top Shot, which is the name of a restaurant uh, kind of bar pub in La Chute with uh, good food and uh, it has become somewhat of a tradition with the awesome players that we order the ribs and a few years ago we asked would it be possible to exchange a poutine instead of the french fries with the rib platter and the staff was uh, nice enough to uh, say yes and then when you get the plate it's a huge stack of ribs dripping with sauce and all the sauce drips down onto the poutine underneath and it is quite delicious but sadly but sadly it was going to be quite a while before we were sinking our teeth into any ribs 
and it was getting cold and nasty and even though some of us had drier clothes and extra layers to put on everybody just wanted to get to the finish line so we just decided to suffer which in the end was a bad decision because when we got to the uh, when we got to the truck and the trailer pretty much everybody agreed that uh, we should have stopped and put on more gear or whatever because it was miserable we eventually did make it back to beautiful La Chute and uh, back to the fairgrounds where Jason and I rolled right into the trailer. It is very nice to have a vehicle on site where you can then change into some dry clothes before heading off to dinner. Uh, we would actually uh, throw Jason's bike out of the trailer because uh, unbeknownst to us, of course, JP had had yet another flat so I would uh, give JP a ride home. Heads. No heads. JP! Your tire's not on the rim! Yeah, look. Something went wrong. So how far did you have to ride on that flat? Uh, my best estimate is 40 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you missed a hell of a ride, man. We had a really good ride. Oh, I had a hell of a ride before. <laughs> Keyword hell. No, no, no. The hell was changing the tire twice. Right. Riding on the flat was easy after that. Yeah, I'm gonna have to find a solution for that. What about beer? What do you think? Have you I tried think it? I think we should go have a drink. Yeah, beer time, so uh, <laughs> goodbye from now. Everything that's said from now Wrap on. Wrap it up, JP, we're thirsty. Yeah, everything that's said from now on is undocumented and unsuitable. We have a rule at the Awesome Players, which is that once the ride is over and everybody is letting their hair down, we turn the cameras off. So we all enjoyed our meal. Uh, once again, there was a ton of door prizes at the Classic. Pretty much everybody wins something. And over the years, members of our team have won some pretty nice stuff. So the uh, the organizers really go the extra distance on rounding up some amazing prizes as well. Only three flat tires. I know every single YouTube video has the line in it about subscribing and hitting that little alarm bell. But if you do it, you will be notified when one of our new videos comes out. Uh, please hit the like button and feel free to leave a comment and the comment can be a question if you'd like as well and we will get back to you if you'd like to email us or buy one of our embroidered patches or stickers head over to awesomeplayers.com and you can click on the order tab and make that happen and be sure to come by our Facebook page and over there is a great place for you to send us a picture or a video or let us know what you're up to once again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us on another little adventure of the Awesome Players Off-Road Motorcycle Club. Thanks for watching.